Thanks for joining us today for the webinar, wherever you're joining from. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we are excited to host this webinar today. Uh, and before we get started, uh, we would like to do a quick poll uh, on where you folks are with your Kubernetes journey and what you're currently doing with, with your monitoring system. So let's get started with the poll. Uh, you should see momentarily about five questions on your screen. Uh, so if you could go ahead and start answering those five questions, we will talk about uh, the results in a, in a few minutes here. Are people able to see the polls? I'm not seeing any questions or answers come through. Chris, are you able to see the poll questions on your screen? Uh, okay, one There's second. People saying they can't see it. You have to okay. relaunch it, I believe. Okay, let me relaunch the poll uh, and see if that works. Yeah, okay. I think now we should be able to see. All right, thank you folks. So if you could uh, go ahead and spend a few minutes answering those five questions, that should be pretty simple. Um, where are you in your Kubernetes journey? As we get answers here, uh, Chris and I will, will share the results as we go through here. So please go ahead and answer those questions. Okay, still waiting for the answers, uh, I don't, yeah. So questions are coming through, answers are coming through. All right. Uh, so we're seeing where are you in your Kubernetes journey? Very good. All right, so Chris, we're seeing, starting to see some answers come through. About 38% of the folks are just getting started with Kubernetes, 20% are in development and testing, and 30% are production. Looks like we have an even mix of people on their Kubernetes journey, uh, which is good. I mean, uh, we have a mix of people at various stages of Kubernetes. Where do you plan on running Kubernetes? Uh, like public, a lot of public cloud. A lot of public cloud, 86%. 50% on-prem. Uh, yeah, let's give it one more minute before we end the poll so you can see the, the results on the screen here shortly. Uh, yeah, it looks like we have a few more coming through. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. And I will share the results on the screen. All right, Chris, so let's take a look at these answers. Uh, about 43% are just getting started with Kubernetes, 29% in development testing, 29% in production. That's a good mix of folks on, in the audience. Uh, a lot of public cloud running, on, uh, running Kubernetes. On-prem is about 50. A few edge locations, interestingly. Uh, so that'd be a good use case we are seeing too in terms of Kubernetes at the edge. Uh, in terms of the biggest challenges with managing Kubernetes, 71% say maintaining HA and reliability. 64% setting up monitoring and alerting, which is good because this, uh, this <laughs> webinar is <laughs> going to <laughs> go in, uh, in, into this, uh, this section here. Troubleshooting, 43, zero downtime upgrades, 36%. Now let's see who is using what in terms of observability. Open source metrics, Prometheus is at the top, 93%, which is great. Uh, and then open source logging, at 36%, service mesh at 21%, traditional APM 14, and traditional infrastructure monitoring at 7, 7%. Chris, any thoughts on this data here? Looks like we have a lot of Prometheus folks on the, on the line today. I, I feel that is as expected, right? It's, it's what the community are developing, yeah. driving towards. Um, it, it, 
not easy to get up and running, but it, once it's once it's there and you've got it exposed, it's something that you can yeah. sort of easily expand. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's something we use it when we can build stuff for our own applications to integrate with it with our own SDK. So very good. So very so good. sort of very extensible, especially if you're DevOps and development types. Yeah. Last question: How do you plan to manage Kubernetes? Forty-three percent said they are looking for a public cloud or a fully managed service like Platform Nine, and then fifty-seven percent self-managed which is uh, fairly typical of uh, the surveys we have done. Uh, about 60% tend to use their op own open source uh, Kubernetes or use distributions. All right, thanks for the poll. Uh, we're gonna stop sharing here and we will continue with the rest of the webinar. So let's go ahead and do a, a quick introduction. I'm, I'm excited uh, to have Chris Jones on this webinar who is going to be the main presenter. Uh, he's eminently uh, you know, suited for this webinar because he spent several years of his career in the APM market. So I'll, I'll let Chris introduce himself and talk about his experience uh, with monitoring and the various companies he has been at. Chris? Cool. Thanks, Kamesh. I will have to admit this photo that is up is vastly different to how I, I look today. I'm uh, one of the many people in the world that has gone months and months without a, a haircut and my beard trimmer broke and they're out of stock. So I'm looking like a mountain man. Apologies for not sharing screens. <laughs> Um, background history, um, as you may tell, I definitely don't have an American accent, but I am in the U.S. We got four years ago, and when I moved, I was with what was uh, at that point Dell Software, and I was managing the uh, portfolio of products that live under Foglight, which is a infrastructure performance management, cost management, migration tool, as well as database performance analytics and application performance monitoring. Um, I was with, with what became Quest and running that, that product and their portfolio of products right up until I joined with Platform 9, where I now run the uh, Kubernetes platform, including our, our free platform that everyone can use, um, and our, our growth and enterprise products as well. Prior to, as I said, prior to being at uh, in the, the product management world, I was actually consulting doing pre-sales and originally started off at a bank and the world of monitoring is something that I've been in almost my entire career. Um, started off at a bank in Australia called National Australia Bank where I was using the EMC Patrol, a really old school infrastructure monitoring platform, did do a little bit of app stuff, did a little bit of sort of really traditional log monitoring, looking for error or um, regex strings and expressions in log files and reporting that back to a essential sir um, that bank is really where i got exposed to what i feel is one of the i guess most robust and best built run and implemented uh, monitoring teams and, and platforms that i've ever come across um, after leaving the bank i spent some time consulting in australia on application performance monitoring with hp diagnostics and ca wiley and the, the suite of tools that lived within the real user monitoring space. Um, got to live through the experience of AppDynamics and New Relic coming along and sort of fundamentally changing that market. And from there, moved into to Quest and joined the, the product management team and started leading a platform. At, at Platform 9, I work with our internal DevOps and SRE teams around the strategy we're taking to monitoring, making sure that we've got coverage and making sure we've got the right tools and teams in place as well. So today I'm really looking forward to sort of sharing a bit of my knowledge, um, love questions, love to make this interactive. Um, so if you have specifics you'd like to ask, um, more than happy to, to help, help answer sort of specific questions and see if we can help improve your, your environment and your approach as well. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, as always, uh, folks, uh, keep those questions coming. There's the Q and A section in Zoom you can ask there or you can ask in, in chat that I'll be monitoring and, and I'll be monitoring this webinar. So by the way, by the way of introduction, my name is Kamesh Pemaraju. I, I head up product marketing here at Platform 9. Um, long story short, my experience has also been in the cloud, private cloud in particular, and open source technologies such as OpenStack and Kubernetes for the past 10 years. And I'm here to host and moderate this session. So please bring those questions on. Uh, we're happy to answer them as we go along. Uh, use either the Q&A uh, or the chat window, whatever works for you. 
so I do want to uh, mention that we, we are going to give away a prize to, to live attendees only. Uh, so we really appreciate that you've attended us, uh, attended our webinar live today. We'll give away this wonderful Saturn V Lego set, uh, but you must be present through the end of today's webinar. So we'll pick one of you from the list and we will announce the winner in the end. So we'll look forward to that as we go through. So really quickly going into the goals of the webinar. Uh, so we'll, you know, as we mentioned in our, uh, in our introduction, we are going to go into the monitoring of containers and Kubernetes and specifically start with what is the difference in the VM world versus the container world. Uh, so the first few sections will be about that. And then uh, Chris, of course, has a lot of experience in the monitoring market. So we're gonna give you a quick update on what's happening in the monitoring market, especially as all of the vendors are trying to also update their portfolios to get into the container and the Kubernetes world. So what should be in your monitoring stack in order to be successful and, uh, and have a, a good monitoring solution for your environment? We'll go through some of those and then we'll end with what, what the solution is from Platform 9. We have this unique SaaS managed approach that makes it extremely easy for you to manage your, your Kubernetes environments as well as your monitoring stack. And we'll end up with a Q&A session in the end, formally. But like I said, feel free to ask questions along the way. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Chris. Uh, so Chris, I'll drive the presentation. Just let me know when to change the slide. Sure, cool. All right, with that, let's, uh, let's jump in. So when I started off in the monitoring world, uh, there was a lot of physical servers. And the, the bank I was working at was doing a, a P to V. Um, Australia was unique in the market at that point in time where the adoption of VMware um, was fast and furious and cannibalized the physical server market in, in about a year. So I watched in rapid fire as things went from physical to virtual. What didn't change were the applications. All the applications stayed the same. Even when we used um, Microsoft's application virtualization to virtualize apps, so we can have multiple versions of Java running within one virtualized server and went from a, a Citrix farm of, you know, nearly a thousand nodes because of all the different versions of Java down to less than 200 nodes in this Citrix farm. The application stayed the same, right? VMs didn't fundamentally change monitoring either. The physical resources definitely didn't change. And what we did there was the same, right? Are they there? CPU memory RAM. What virtual machines did introduce was some new metrics and stuff like that. It had a little bit of a learning curve for the infrastructure teams, but overall, mostly we, we stayed the chain. We stayed the same. If we move forward, what came next? Public cloud. Clouds came next. What were people running in clouds? A lot of people were using software as a service, which means you were dependent on a vendor to expose and be honest and truthful with you about their performance and availability. People also went to platforms as a service, be it RDS or um, SQL Server and Azure. And businesses also started moving virtual machines wholesale as instances into the cloud. Once again, fundamentally not changing the application architecture. You could still have a traditional application with middleware, a front end, back end services and databases running as virtualization and running in the cloud. They're going to be very similar to each other. What happens next? Containers have been coming along, right? Over the last five years, we've seen a lot of people trying to adopt containers and build out microservices. So very consumer facing brands like Netflix made containers a lot more popular and Kubernetes came along and has become the, the, the platform of choice for, for running and orchestrating containers at scale. Fundamentally, containers are transforming applications. I've worked with, with some customers, um, both here and at, at Quest, where people tried to take their monolithic applications and put it in a container. For whichever reason, they're building containers with 256 gigabyte of RAM and running giant, giant Java-based applications. That's not transforming the app. When 
we look at containerization, we're trying to build out microservices that we can scale out, have replicas, have dependent, have, have reduced dependencies on single points of failure and scale, which means there's more of them, right? The infrastructure also changes. People virtualize Kubernetes quite often, which means your nodes are scaling up and down, especially if you're in the public cloud. So all of a sudden, things that used to be easy to get to and always there are no longer there. They're a little bit more transient in nature. And most people that I've worked with in the past few years are running across multiple clouds, right? Both Azure, AWS, a little bit of Google. So there's more apps running in more locations and they operate differently. And this means we have an unpredictable application stack. It's significantly more complicated, right? Monitoring a VM, you knew it was pretty much going to be there. A lot of people attempted to build out uh, private cloud offerings on, on um, platforms like OpenStack, which we also um, operate for a number of companies globally. OpenStack does give you the, availability, the ability to scale VMs on demand. And it did allow applications to be able to burst and perform in a different way. But mostly those VMs were fairly static, like they're always going to be there, which meant log files were easy to get. Log files are also easy to get because you can SSH onto a server and you know where they're going to be. Just like they were in the physical world, same as that in the virtual world. When we bring in containers, that's not the same. And all of a sudden, the VMs that are scaling are scaling more frequently up and down based on your users' workloads. So those log files that might have been on the VM are gone. The logs that are in those containers are gone. The data about performance is gone. The ability to pull up something like a task manager on Windows or run top on your Linux and Unix machines, right, is has been taken away. So a lot of a lot of the the monitoring crutches when people say I've got a problem, I want to go to the source of truth. I'm going to log onto this server or this VM and I'm, I want to see what's going on with those resources. They're gone. Which means we need to take a different approach. And we need to look at each of the individual pieces of the stack in, a, in an approach that I used to work with customers for building out application performance monitoring. Um, it's also something that is common in the SRE world is picking the unique interactions looking at them end to end and understanding all of those dependencies. If we look at a super high level of Kubernetes, right? We need to first understand that base layer. What are we running on, right? Are we in the cloud? Are we on physical? Are we on virtual? What's that infrastructure layer doing? If there's no coverage there, that's a huge blind spot. The next step up would be akin to monitoring something like virtual center for the metrics and data that's coming out of that. But in this case, it's now Kubernetes. Kubernetes has a lot more constructs going on, a lot more isolation, a lot more pieces that are moving constantly. And we have containers, there's gonna be multiple then. We have pods, we have CSI plugins, we have CNI drivers that are installed, and there's the cluster information as well. Then we've got to worry about the operating system too. So that's another distinct layer that needs to be thoroughly understood and monitored to make sure there's no gaps in the coverage. As you saw on the port side, a lot of people are using Prometheus for, the, for this piece. Once we step up, we get into the app layer. Now that has changed because there's more, a lot of the sort of traditional APM tools are still trying to come to, to terms with what that means. Um, they generate a lot of data, especially if you're running a new Relic or an App Dynamics or even something like the Jaeger in an open source world. Um, that's a lot of data that comes out of those. So a lot of, a lot of tooling is still coming up to speed in that space. And that means we need to default onto something, which is uh, log files, which are all there. But once again, they could be trapped inside the, the container. So we need something that can get to those application log files as well. So that is understanding that, that leaves us with the question of what breaks. In the world of Kubernetes, a lot can break, right? We, we recently launched a, a free platform for managed Kubernetes. So you bring the infrastructure, 
connect it to our control plane and we'll deploy, upgrade, patch, manage Kubernetes for you. That platform, our, our cloud, as we call it, is actually on a container platform. It's running in Kubernetes. And we went through a massive learning curve. We're running many of our unique and distinct customer instances as it all segregated in VMs. Now we've moved it to a container platform. Well, what do we see? Boom killed, crash loop, back off, issues with quorum, right? If you're then running this on a virtualized layer, there's contention to look at, right? Kubernetes has limits and bounds put in place for pods and containers. What it doesn't know if it's virtualized is what's going on on that underlying layer. So all of a sudden, this still needs to be, in, be accounted for, right? If your Kubernetes is virtualized and you've still got traditional apps running on the same infrastructure, maybe you've got a database that's taking up all of the disks and driving a lot of IOPS, Kubernetes is not aware of that. If there's CPU ready or memory ballooning, Kubernetes is not aware of that. So the complications that came in when you ran J Java on a, on a virtual machine and needing to actually reserve those memory limits still hold true in the container world, but there's two layers to try to troubleshoot through there. Applications, how do you scale to zero? We're about to um, uplift our cloud platform to be able to scale itself to zero. So basically sleep instances where people haven't logged in for a while. Um, so that's one thing. How do you treat that? That's not out. That's in a, that's in a known state. That's healthy, right? How do you troubleshoot things that aren't threading properly, right? How do you then pinpoint slow methods and functions? So there's a lot of stuff that needs to be paid attention to and a lot of aspects that you need to understand to be able to effectively troubleshoot those applications. So something's gone wrong. What happened, right? I'm sure everyone has run this command and done kubectl describe pod and got a, a huge list of, of data and you scroll to the bottom of it and you're like, I want to see the events. What's, what's going on within this pod and the containers that are in there? So you do that. What happens after that? You're going to go looking for log files. And once again, these log files aren't where they used to be. So you're thinking, well, I, I, need, a, I need a logging solution or I'm going to be spending hours and hours troubleshooting. After the log files, you know, a lot of companies don't run application tracing, sort of the, the, the APM approach of getting in the app, but they really do help, right? If you're trying to understand a slowdown, you know, maybe it's not a, maybe it's not a, an unkill pod or a, or a crash loop that's going on, right? Maybe it is an application slowdown. Do you have tracing that you can go and look at? Is that pod even still there? So Chris, a uh, question. Uh, so you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier Jaeger. Is that something people use for tracing applications or debugging? What, where does Jaeger fit into all of this? Yeah, Jaeger is a, another instrumentation product for application runtime. So it's doing bytecode instrumentation, similar to the likes of the Elastic Open APM stuff, the new relics of the world, Instanas, AppDynamics, so it's getting traces. We use it um, within our, our cloud infrastructure. We've used it within our, our OpenStack product to troubleshoot community problems and slowdowns as well. Um, Uber is the company that did a lot of, a lot of investment in, in Jaeger. Yeah. The last piece is what I like to call carbon-based monitoring. Um, one of my friends and mentors introduced me to this concept, and that's the good old user the calling out. And in this day and age, that's just not acceptable. You're not going to get the opportunity to, to actually interact with a lot of consumers, especially if you're a B2C business. They're going to move on and they're probably not going to come back. And if they do come back, you're really lucky. And that's the last place that you, you really want to be finding out about a problem. And so altogether, I, this sort of means... Yep. So ideally, what you want is to be able to determine the root cause way before the bug report comes in, right? That's the, that's the goal of this whole monitoring system. Proactive, responsive, the ability to fix problems uh, earlier in the life cycle, right? Is that kind of the goal of, of all the monitoring systems that you're building? Correct. It's important to have them in sort of staging and QA environments as well so you can see the, the performance data. 
you know, that old adage of fixing something in production is more expensive than in development still holds true, right? Containers hasn't changed that. Yeah. You might be able to patch it quicker, but if you found it in production, you've got a, a B2C, you know, platform, be it a, a, an app, a web app, that's going to cost you money. That's, that's not going to be a great experience for, for your users. And that's right to that point, right? This is all lost time and, and, and lost revenue. So if we step into the, the market a little bit, and I've been, I've been touching on these as we go along, I sort of, when I think about monitoring from a, a structural point of view and the, I guess the barriers to success within an organization, uh, I break it down into to three buckets. When I started the platform nine, this is what I did. And, you know, my, my boss, the VP of, of product and one of the co-founders was like, I want to understand what your opinion is, Chris, on our, our, our internal monitoring and the, the stack that the SRE team is, is operating. So the first one is let's make sure our infrastructure is covered. And there's a lot of tools out here that do this. Um, I probably should have Prometheus up here. My apologies making sure that you're looking at all the individual metrics that are available, making sure that you're keeping a historic record of those. So you can start seeing seasonal changes and running predictive analytics. A lot can be achieved through good infrastructure monitoring that's, that's there persistent and available. Um, you see Cortex listed there, right? That's a great way to federate Prometheus. Um, it's a pretty big product as well. There's lots of, of new players on the market like Science Logic and Sysdig. Datadog sort of started in this space as well. Um, Foglight, my old product, also does all your clouds, Kubernetes, and virtualization. Um, some of these tools will just do monitoring. Some of these will do a lot more and get into contention analytics. They'll get into forecasting of capacity problems and stuff like that, which is an important area to have a, a good understanding of. And I guess within a lot of enterprises, this is where everyone starts. And this is also where a lot of people stop and they don't get much further. Even database performance monitoring gets, gets neglected in a lot of, a lot of enterprises that I've interacted with. Um, and a lot of people keep this data as like a closely guarded secret. So then sort of developers and application op teams can't even see it. So when there's a problem, it just goes around in circles. One of the, I guess one of the changes that happened in the past, 10 years was the, the popularity of logs. Um, there was a lot of merger and acquisitions around sort of HP, um, I believe ArcSight was another one. And people started consolidating and saying, well, I can do everything just by looking at logs. That's great. Logs can really help troubleshoot problems, but they're not a real time indicator, right? It's been logged, it's got to be moved, it's got to be indexed, and then you can see it, and then you've got to analyze it, you've got to have a pattern you can find. So logs are important, and especially in the container and Kubernetes world, um, this is something that is, is paramount. Without a uh, good logging solution that's collecting your logs, even if you're only persisting them for hours or days because of the budget constraints or storage constraints, it does give your teams the ability to see what happened in the past, especially if, if pods are scaling, especially if you've got you know, that transient nature within your infrastructure, keeping those logs gives you the ability to go back in time and saying, hey, what's going on? Um, I'll touch on the logging a little bit more around what we use later in the presentation. The last piece is all about application performance monitoring. Um, you know, I don't think this term has, has diminished in, in importance. What did happen in the industry as I was working in it and experiencing it, there was a big focus on the original vendors. So the BMCs, the CompuWare, which is now Dynatrace, the HPs, the CAs, to build out unified, integrated monitoring platforms. So the ability to say, here's my infrastructure, here's my databases, here's my applications, and then instrument all of those, tag, customer and user interaction, be it through message queuing, be it through Java, .NET, your other application languages, seeing those calls down into a database, seeing how that SQL performed and tying it all together. 
in 2010, 2011, 2012, that was what the market was executing against. That's where Gartner thought everyone should go. And that's what vendors were doing. Uh, when I started first working with Quest Foglight, that's what it did. And that's what it did better than anyone else. You could look at a, a Java interaction and you could trace it all the way down through to the impact of that SQL query on a shared storage array. The big benefit of APM is it's user focused. And if we look at that market holistically, what we have now are very siloed and bucketed tools. AppDynamics and New Relic came into the market hot and heavy and said, hey, let's not worry about all that other stuff. Let's, let's go straight to the application itself. Let's go to those application teams and let's make everyone instrument their applications because that's the most important thing. On one side, they were correct. On another side, they were really off the point, right? By only focusing on what's going on the application, a lot of data was going unseen. A lot of contention was going unmeasured. So yes, applications could be improved, but those platforms when they first launched just ignored the infrastructure underneath. They ignored storage IOPS. They ignored what was going on in the, the virtual layer. You'll see here, I've got Elastic sort of floating in between logs only and APM. Um, there's a great, great resource online if you're looking to build out a stack and you're looking at these logos and sort of saying, well, how do I do this? Um, the Open APM initiative, if you Google it, you'll get a, um, a great interactive website where you can choose what you've got or maybe what you want to have. And it'll actually build out that stack and tell you which of these open source tools are able to talk to each other. Now, Elastic is using um, Kibana to bring a lot of this together. Um, Loki's in there with Prometheus and they're sort of really hyper-focused on what's going on within the Kubernetes world and logs specifically and keeping them in context with the, the pods. So it's another great option for, for almost getting to a, an APM level, but doing two things at once. Um, AppDynamics is expanding and trying to build out that dependency and topology information now in their platform. Um, Datadog is touching all those points and everyone's trying to build out AI machine learning. New, New Relic's doing that too. Um, another one you see there is Instana. That's one of the, the newest players on the block. Um, they, they've built from the ground up with this in mind, right? Let's keep it all related. Let's keep it all mapped together so you can see if there's problems and any dependencies between things by design. So this kind of leads to a, the, the question, right? What should I be doing? Um, in my time, consulting, selling, product managing in the, the application world, one of the things that I've seen be most successful in an organization is you need a dedicated team. Every organization that has invested in a monitoring infrastructure and invested in the team to run it always has a better outcome than organizations that don't. And I can't stress this enough. A team dedicated to monitoring, even if it's just starting with infrastructure, you can build views and you can logically group things in nearly every tool so you can get an application view of anything with all the infrastructure monitoring tools. With a dedicated team, you know that infrastructure is going to be there and available for monitoring, even if it's a, a SaaS hosted solution. And that team will bit by bit start learning and understanding every critical application in your business and all the pieces that relate to it. Because you can't build a dashboard to show your e-commerce portal and all of the infrastructure related to it without first asking that question writing it down, documenting it, communicating it, socializing it, setting up the monitoring, setting up the escalation. The next evolution from there is to be user focused. And this is what SRE focuses on, right? Find those top interactions, even if they're APIs, and make sure that you document which ones are important, all of the interactions that's in them end to end, end, to end and then understand all the failure points along the way and say, well, where's my gaps? I've got logging and I've got infrastructure monitoring. I know nine out of our top 10 interactions go through RabbitMQ, but that's a black hole. We don't have anything in there. Okay, so now you've identified that you have a hole. It's focused on the interactions, right? Knowing MQ is healthy is fine, 
knowing that a message got through it is even better. So don't focus on the infrastructure. That will naturally come through troubleshooting and trying to improve performance and improve customer experience. Always focus on the user. And the last point is integrate. Um, one, of the, one of the best things that I ever did in my career was actually uh, prevent myself from selling to an organization in the future. Um, I was actually wrapping up employment with a consultancy and about to join what was, what was Quest. And for this particular insurance company in, in Australia, I wrote a, a enterprise strategy for performance monitoring systems management. And that company had a number of tools that had taken an approach prior to um, my engagement around what team should use what. And they let them all go best of breed. But then all of a sudden, they felt like they didn't have coverage. What they didn't have was a dedicated team, and what they didn't have was shared knowledge, and they didn't have each person allowing access to each other's tools, which meant troubleshooting in war rooms was just an absolute nightmare. What I put down the strategy for them was stick with this, consolidate that data, integrate it where possible, and start sharing that knowledge between your teams. Right? Integrating tools also means integrating teams and sharing knowledge and being open and transparent. And that meant that it became much easier to, to manage clouds so, and manage their infrastructure. Moving on to a little bit more specific about what we have today. Um, Platform 9 has a managed bare metal capability so we can provision from bare metal up and turn that into a, a bare metal cloud even if, you, if you're running something like MongoDB because you've got large workloads. We also have managed OpenStack in Kubernetes, but importantly to underpin and support all of this and our infrastructure, your infrastructure, your performance and your customers, we have an observability pillar. And that's in two pieces, right? What we run internally and also what we give you to use in OpenStack and, and Kubernetes. So if we look at Kubernetes, what do we focus on? We focus on entirely on the infrastructure stack. So making sure that we're monitoring the nodes that are involved and making sure that we're looking at what's going on in the, the Kubernetes layer as well. So with every single cluster that you deploy throughout our, our, our SaaS management plane, we will give you the opportunity to enable monitoring. It's on by default. It deploys Prometheus, Grafana, and Alert Manager. And it's looking at the OS, the Kubernetes metrics, the cluster, the nodes, and the pods. And that's out of the box. Behind the scenes, we're also collecting information about your infrastructure, communicating that back into our observability platform. And when something goes wrong, we'll notify you about that as well. So this is a, a screenshot of our, our platform on the cluster health page. You'll see here, I've got three clusters. Um, the one at the very bottom is coming up. The top two, you'll see under links. There's a number of aspects of there you can interact with the cluster. One of them is getting kube config, which is super helpful. You also see the, the Kubernetes dashboard links there, but you also see Grafana, which means anywhere in the world you can click on that link and it will securely connect you into the Grafana instance that the, uh, the Prometheus and Grafana instances that are monitoring that infrastructure. What we're also doing, if we go to the next slide, is bringing that data in and consolidating it across all of your clusters. You've got 10 clusters. This monitoring dashboard will be showing the alarms across every single one of those, those dashboards. This is the, the Grafana dashboard that's built in, right? This is the, the cluster explorer view. Um, and can I, can I jump through two slides pretty quickly there? Um, let's go back one more. So this, this monitoring view that I was talking about, this is every alarm that's firing across all of your clusters. Um, right now, we're showing the last 24 hours. Um, always open to feedback and, and want to hear what people um, would love to see there. This is a piece that we're building out um, actively right now. Engineering is, is adding in more capabilities. So right now, you just see alarm overview. We'll then be exposing the rules and we're going to start setting up um, the ability to configure um, integrations with Slack, email, all of the ones that um, Prometheus and Alert Manager support. And you'll be able to configure that in our SaaS management plane, it'll push down to all of those connected clusters and Prometheus, and you'll be able to start getting alerts and control the, the rules as well, all from here and from, a, from our SaaS management plane. Um, 
let's jump forward into what we've got running internally. So as I said, right, we've got a cloud that runs clouds. We have the monitoring that goes into your clusters that you can use and consume to make sure everything is healthy and performing. What do we use internally? So we've got a number of layers, right? We have operating systems, we have virtual machines, we have physical stuff, right? We've got Prometheus there. We use exporters. We've got logs that are going into ALK. Um, in the Kubernetes layer, much the same. And then once we get into the applications, it's Prometheus and logs again. If we move forward a slide. So what does this look like in terms of, you know, a, a nice architecture diagram? It's native metrics and logs integrated at the, the Kubernetes layer. So we're using FluentD to forward logs to, to ELK. We're using Prometheus across every instance, and that's everyone's instances that we run. So our cloud running other people's cloud, collecting that data into our Cortex so we can see the availability and performance of our infrastructure in context with the application performance because we have a Prometheus SDK that forwards application logging as well. Um, Elk does all of our log aggregation. And then to visualize and pull all this together, we have uh, Grafana and, and Kibana in our stack. Hey, Chris, uh, real quick uh, time check here. We're about 15 minutes left in the webinar. Uh, there are mm -hmm. questions coming through. There's one question now, I think it's, uh, it's relevant to what you're talking about. The question is, how did Platform 9 end up selecting this particular stack, Prometheus, Elk, and Cortex? Mm -hmm. Actually, if we go to the next slide, I, I might have, no, I don't. So how did we end up on that? Um, yeah. A couple of years ago, that was kicked off as, a, as, a, as an initiative. We built a, an SRE team and they went out to the market and sort of said, well, what's, what's there and what works? Um, you know, we have OpenStack and Kubernetes. What's something that can do both? Prometheus, right? Our, our mission is to make open source easy and consumable for, for everyone. And that meant that we selected open source by design and we started building our platform based off of, off of Prometheus. We then needed a way to federate that. Um, federation is always tricky no matter what monitoring platform you've got. So we selected Cortex um, and we've been working with them and upgrading um, frequently. And we built that out and we've stabilized that really well over the last sort of six months. Um, Elk wasn't where we started. We actually started with Logly. Um, we wanted to get something up and running, so we had coverage. So we did that first um, as we built out the, the Elk stack. Um, and then the visualization layer, Grafana has been popular in the market for a number of years now, and it's also open source. So that made sense. So then everything we use internally, we then productized, and we started pushing that out to the public. So when we bring all of that together in context with our platform, we enable the ability to run anywhere you want to run. If it's an edge location and you want to manage the hardware, go for it. If it's edge location, you want us to do it, we'll use our bare metal capabilities. If you want to run virtualization, we'll help you do that. Kubernetes will help you do that. The monitoring stack is there. It's always there. There's stuff in your clusters that you get access to and there's stuff that we do remotely that's always there. So if something goes down, we will email you. If there's a problem in performance, We'll email you if there's a massacre in your cluster, you'll get notified as well. We have API endpoints that are accessibly, accessible globally. And we'll also happily connect into Azure and AWS. And that's all from our central management plane. And I believe next I was gonna jump into a little bit of our, our product and then we'll open to questions. Sound good? Yep. Cool. I'm going to, if you stop sharing, Kamesh, I will yep. share my screen. Yep. Go ahead. All right. Let me know if you have any issues. So this is um, our, our free platform. So anyone can sign up and get access to this. Um, what we're looking at here is the infrastructure dashboard. I'm on the clusters page and you can see I've got, I've got two clusters right now. Um, this one here is a, a single node cluster that I built, I built earlier. And 
if you want to know what's going on from a, a health perspective, you can come into this Node Health dashboard. It will show you all of the individual components that we run, manage, and operate for you. Um, no performance has some resource utilization data, but importantly, Grafana is there. We can click into it, link out, and you can see, right, system up point, uptime, 3.2 weeks, right? We can see what available resources are there. This is looking at a, an individual node. So this is actually a, a multi-node cluster that I'm looking at. Um, if I go back here and drill into my second cluster, um, I've actually got a multi-node cluster that I built yesterday. And we have a, a Fluent D feature that we're actually building out. Uh, we're about to release it as a, an early access feature so people can play around and test and test it. So I went through the process of deploying that and then actually deploying, um, as I change to our, our pods dashboard, I'm going to change to my monitoring demo. And you can see here, I have Elastic and Kibana running. So they're up and available. Um, I use the node port to expose Kibana, but you could also use Metal LB depending on your infrastructure where we'll deploy and manage that for you too. Um, and here is that Kibana running off of uh, one of the nodes. And I've got all the, the Kubernetes logs coming in. Um, if you haven't seen Kibana before, it's filtering by a particular cluster here on the left. And I actually added Kubernetes host as the, the main pivot. So if I collapse this up, you'll see Kubernetes host is here and I can see all the logs coming in for that particular um, host itself. Another piece that I, I did this morning, just so you can sort of see, right, this is a, an open source approach. Um, here is our one of our internal dashboards looking at console, which is a, a platform we use to, to managing our, our platforms. Um, you can see here in Grafana, we've got a lot of dashboards we've built. So there's a lot of data that we're collecting and, and we can drill into. This is what our ops teams and SRE teams use to keep everyone running. Um, if you're in the position where you'd rather get up and running quickly, um, what I would sort of highly recommend as a tool that, that I found useful over the last few years is um, a platform called Instana. Um, it's super easy to get up and running. Um, once you sign up, you'll actually land on a, a getting started page. They'll build your instance. And then you can quickly put in your Kubernetes cluster's name, copy the um, Helm chart install, um, assuming you had Helm installed somewhere, um, run that on the node and that'll connect and almost instantly, right, within a, a number of minutes, connect you into Instana and you'll start seeing data coming through right away. So this is their platform. I only have the, the Kubernetes piece running right now. Um, so I've drilled into the top level view of the cluster. You know, I can see the nodes. This is my single node cluster. Um, I can see my deployments. Immediately here, I can see I've got something going wrong with Calico. So I can drill into that and I can see this issue called out here and available replicas is less than desired replicas. So immediately it's found a problem for me and all I did was install the Helm chart. So this is another great um, integrated APM platform that will pull in metrics as well as get inside of your applications as well. That's I think really worth looking at and super easy to, to get up and running as well. Um, and with that, with 10 minutes to spare, I will All right. click stop share and we can jump into questions. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, so folks, there are a lot of questions coming through. Let's uh, kind of start with the first one here. Uh, can we, yeah, okay. Uh, so first question, Chris, um, is log monitoring possible in Grafana? Should we really go with Elk or some other tool for log monitoring? That's a good question. Um, the, the, the first question that came out was how did we land on what we, we landed on? Um, one of the pieces we did look at and one of the applications we've looked at deploying into people's clusters and, and managing it was Loki. Um, Loki works with, with PromQL. It, it tags um, Kubernetes logs in a, a, a way that makes it fairly consumable. Um, and that was another tool that we, we looked at to have an integrated stack. So then it could, it could be pulled into Grafana using the same, the same query languages. Um, unfortunately, because of our unique circumstance in the software we're operating and the scale we're getting to, um, we felt that, that Loki was too early in its, its life cycle. Um, and we went with the, the, the Elk stack. Um, 
Elk was originally disqualified when we we're looking at the Prometheus up to Cortex stack. Um, now we have Elk running where it's sort of beginning the process of that sort of continuous improvement and also looking at their open APN agents and seeing if this is something that makes sense. So I think in terms of what makes sense in terms of logs, if you purely focus on the Kubernetes infrastructure, I think Loki is a, a great thing to look at. Um, if you're going a little bit more broadly than that, um, Elastic is a great open source example, and then you've got the, the paid for tools. Um, and it, it really comes down to what data are you putting into a, a platform and how do you then want to be able to, to visualize it as well. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next question is, um, if I, which metrics really matter in a Kubernetes cluster and application site? How do you decide which metrics we should collect in a microservices environment? Oof, that's another really good question. If you're going sort of the, the Prometheus route, it's going to pull in everything for you. Um, more metrics, the merrier. If, if there's a storage problem in terms of the, the rate that data is coming in, which would probably be the, the driving factor for, for limiting, unless you're really going completely custom and building something from the ground up, and I would sort of advise against that, that really has a, a single point of failure, right? You'll have someone with all that knowledge, and if they leave, you've, you've lost it. So I would look at how long do you want to store the data for them? And how, how often are you sampling it would be the, the two questions I'd use beside that. Most monitoring platforms, um, if, you go, if you go Prometheus, it's going to collect everything. And it's, it's developed by the, the community and it's really heavily focused on Kubernetes. So it's always collecting the most relevant metrics, especially if you're keeping up to date with it. Um, and that will really come down to how much data do you want to store. Um, Cortex is one way to forward it off of the Prometheus instance, or you could, you could federate your Prometheuses. Um, it does scrape at a very high frequency that does generate terabytes of data. Um, and the, the history roll up and sort of compression of data. Um, so in other words, the fidelity you get when you go back in time um, is also another consideration for, for storage. If you are limited, try to get just over a month. So if you can get to sort of six, seven weeks, That'll give you that monthly rolling window. Um, past that, most organizations I've worked with have, have gone to 13 months. They can always have a, an end of year sort of trailing month there as well. Um, right. What makes sense for microservices? Trace data, if you can get it. Otherwise, build an SDK using something like Prometheus and, and instrument your app yourself. You really want login times. You want to find those important transactions. You want to understand what they are, all those pieces and make sure you've got at least some, even if it's just infrastructure metric along all of those points as well. More questions coming in. Chris, uh, let me pick another one right here. Thanks for that answer, by the way. Nice, nice detailed answer. Another question is many companies already have log systems. So there's a question here. If we already have a log system in place, how do I, or can I integrate those logs into platform nine? So I think that's a, that's a good question. We, we thought about building out a, a log, a hosted log platform. Um, it was pretty, it was evident quickly that that wasn't something that we wanted to get into. We don't want to complete with a Splunk or a Sumo logic or anything like that. So there's no integration into our, our platform. Um, the Prometheus and Grafana that's, that's deployed and operated right now, we keep that very locked down. So it's, is focused on exactly what I, I mentioned on the OS, the nodes, the pods, and the, the cluster and the Kubernetes metrics. Um, you could forward that data and federate it out. Um, but in terms of, of, of logging itself, I would say if, you're, if we're managing a cluster for you, just extend your logging, right? Um, I'm about to post some stuff on our, our Fluent D operator. Um, You'll be able to post a, a change to the custom resource definition for that, that operator and set the output. Um, we've got a webinar coming up in, in August where we go through this with, with JFrog using that operator to actually post to that Kibana instance and Elk instance that I just showed you. So if you had it running, I would say, you know, leverage something like that and start forwarding all those logs out into your existing platform. Excellent. 
A uh, couple of additional questions here. Uh, do developers have to have special coding practices in order to take advantage of Platform 9? I'm not sure what coding nope. practices he's referring to. Maybe, uh, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, maybe DevOps tooling and stuff like that. Um, yeah. This is something Connection and I just spend a, yeah. a big amount of time discussing um, and actually you know, sort of talking about the strategy and approaches to this. Um, as a company, you know, as I said, we want to make open source available and easy. We want to make clouds open and easy to everyone. So we run open source clouds for people. What we do in terms of integrating with your development environment is we'll work with you to make sure that the tooling you have in place, assuming you want to keep it, is going to work with what we have. So we have Terraform providers you can get access to. Um, we have uh, a treasure trove of Ansible scripts that can be used. We've got an API that's available as well. So your developers shouldn't have to change their workflow experiences at all. Um, and if that was the case as a product manager, I'd love to hear that because I, I want to make this easy to get into to your environment so you can run Kubernetes or virtualization you know, without having to, to fundamentally change what you're doing today. All right, I think we can squeeze in one more question before we run out of time here. So this one's an interesting one. If I try to set up a monitoring application for my cluster, it takes up a lot of CPU. Uh, is that, how, how should we, I guess the question is, how much CPU or what does Platform 9 do to address that? That is a really good question. So there's a few different factors that you should take into account when you're architecting a, a monitoring platform. Um, one of the age old questions is, you know, how do you know what's going on inside of the box if you're inside of the box? That's true for psychology. That was true for physical monitoring, virtual monitoring, and it's the same for, for, for Kubernetes. Um, best practice is externalize it. Set up a, a dedicated monitoring infrastructure, which is why it's great to have a team to look after it, or use a SaaS platform. If you're worried about resource utilization from the monitoring itself, you need to tune the frequency at which the data is getting collected. Um, this is why it's always important to, to, to test an APM tool that does tracing um, with load testing. So you can see the impact of that instrumentation. Um, collecting something every five seconds, great when you're in a real time problem. Do you need it at three o'clock in the morning when all your users are internal users and they're all asleep? Probably not. It's going to consume disk and it's going to generate load. If you've got backups and running and stored procedures and jobs processing things, it's, it could impact their performance as well. So it's that balance and trade off between how granular do you need the data? How long do you want to keep it for? Um, and if it's impacting performance, I would definitely start dialing back the, the frequency of data collection and back to that question about which metrics to, to collect, right? API server response times, huge thing, memory and CPU limits and utilization so you can troubleshoot quickly. Um, I'll start scaling back the, the total number of metrics. Um, but I, if you've externalized the hosting of the platform itself and it's just doing remote collections or agent-based collections, which is very popular these days with um, Kubernetes monitoring, um, it shouldn't be taking up too much load on those, those individual nodes. All right, Chris, we're, we're at the top of the hour. Well, we need to wrap up here. I do want to announce the winner of the NASA Apollo Saturn V Lego set. And the lucky winner is Antonio Barrows, product manager. Congratulations, Antonio. We're gonna reach out to you separately and ship you the, the Lego set. Have fun with it. Uh, thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. Uh, we've tried to answer as many questions as possible. There is a couple of different questions still outstanding. We will try and answer them uh, in a blog post shortly. Thank you so much for attending again. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in a future webinar. Have a great day.